Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's video is a little different from what we normally run on the channel. Typically, we don't discuss all that much about our exact testing methodologies and the improvements that we constantly make to get better data or data if you're an American. But for our monitor testing, well, we're rolling out a lot of changes and improvements at once. I was talking to Steve about it last week and he was like, this is all super interesting stuff. You've got to make a video about it. So here I am. Hopefully this will be interesting to at least some of you. And for the rest, it will be a good reference just in case you want to see how things are done. So our monitor testing has been fine up until now. We cover most of the important stuff, but it wasn't really as in depth as I wanted it, especially in some areas. So a couple of months ago, in fact, quite a few months ago now, I started work on a whole new display testing suite, version 2.0 or something like that. The idea was to get more data, more relevant data, more in-depth testing, more HDR testing and so on, so we could continue to offer really high quality monitor reviews for you guys. Some of the tests I wanted would require new tools and specifically custom tools. I wanted to automate a lot of the tedious response time testing and you can't really just go and buy an off the shelf device to do that. So thanks to our patrons who support us so we can afford to do stuff like this. And thanks to Patreon member Neems in particular, who is an engineer and helped design the testing hardware and software. We're ready for a whole bunch more testing, which I'm gonna run through today. Not everything has been updated. Our color tests are unchanged. So all that lovely talk about Delta E's will remain. We'll continue to use Portrait Software's Calman 5 for our color analysis. Big thanks to the guys at Portrait for helping out with that. And we are also going to continue using DisplayCal for our calibration profiling, which is a great free tool for that purpose. The biggest changes are for our response time testing. Previously, we used a photo detector hooked up to an oscilloscope to test things like gray to gray averages and so on. But this was super time consuming to record all the information and we ended up only using a 10 sample average, which is fine, but it's nothing amazing. With our new automated test tool, we've been able to up that to 110 samples, which is just great for improving accuracy and making the testing easier for us. We could probably do even more samples, but 110 is probably enough for now. The result of taking 110 samples is we can now show full data tables like this. TFT Central were the first guys I saw that used this type of color graded table and I feel it's a really great way to convey the data to you guys. So this is what we'll be using. Big shout out to TFT Central who also do great work and sort of, I guess, pioneered this method of presenting the data. On the left, you can see all the response time numbers for all 110 transitions. In the upper right quadrant, we have the rise times and the bottom left, we have the fall times. For every 10% step in the grayscale from zero to 100. Each number is an average of multiple runs for that data point too. So the total number of samples here is huge just for the response time, hence why we needed some sort of automated tool to produce something like this. The color grading is pretty straightforward. Anything below 5.0 milliseconds gets a nice shade of green that gets deeper as the display gets faster. Everything in the six to nine millisecond range is a yellow orange, and that gets deeper, progressing to red when around 13 milliseconds. Anything beyond orange is pretty slow these days. Below that, we have a number of metrics. Standard stuff is included here. You've got your average gray to gray, which is of course the average of all the numbers above. Then there's the average rise, average fall, the 02550 or black white black transition time, the best time recorded, the worst time recorded, and an interesting metric, which is the average dark level. And I'll explain more about that later. You'll also spot a few metrics here detailing how many transitions fall within the refresh rate window and within one millisecond of the refresh rate window. This tells us whether say a 144 hertz monitor is actually achieving 144 hertz in practice or whether it's effectively being bottlenecked by the response times. Typically we like to see you know an 80 to 90 percent within the response time window here for it to be performing about as expected for the refresh rate. On the right of the picture is something we've been recording for a while and noting down but not really showing in our reviews and that's the response time error otherwise called overshoot for rise times and undershoot for fall times. Bad overshoot causes haloing and inverse ghosting during fast motion. It's ugly and just as bad as smearing, ghosting and blur you get with slow response times on the left. So ideally, if you're looking at these two graphs on the screen right now, you'd want pretty much everything on the left to be green, pretty much everything on the right to be green as well. That would be the ideal case, of course, but as you increase the speed and you get more green on the left, typically that means you're gonna get more red on the right. So it's a lot of a balancing act with these sort of displays, and this will give you much clearer information as to where the balance lies with all the different overdrive modes in a monitor. 
The color threshold for error on the right is 15%. That's where I found I can start to notice the artifacts of inverse ghosting. Below the table, we have the average error and worst error recorded, fairly self-explanatory. There's also the percentage of transitions with an error above 15%. Obviously, we want to keep that low. And for this new suite of testing, we're sticking to at least what I'm calling the 15-15 rule. In other words, when choosing the best overdrive mode, we want to see no more than 15% of transitions with errors above 15%. The great thing about having automated testing is we can create charts like this for all the overdrive modes in the monitor settings, and that's what we'll be doing for our upcoming monitor reviews. So we'll not only be explaining which overdrive mode is best, but why, and with the data on screen to show it all. It'll also allow you to make your own decisions about overdrive based on your own specific tolerances for blur and overdrive issues. On top of this, we'll be showing comparison graphs for a number of the key metrics. To get a good baseline of numbers for future reviews, I went back and retested every monitor I could easily access with the new tool. So that was a total of 17 displays, so fresh data for everything. In most cases, the basic averages didn't change all that much. In some cases, the updated numbers are quite different, but overall, this is a more accurate test methodology with more data for you to see. Anyway, here we have the standard gray to gray average, you're used to that. We also have the dark level average, and this is key for measuring VA displays. VA panels have much slower transitions in the 0 to 40% gray range. This new number is a quick average of all the transitions up to 40% gray, so we can easily summarize which VA panels have the worst dark level smearing and how they compare to something like an IPS that might be slower overall but have better dark level smearing. Next up is the refresh rate compliance test. Here we can see how every monitor fares in delivering response times within the refresh rate window. Then we have average error, want to keep that as low as possible. Next is our inverse ghosting test or the percentage of transitions with errors above 15%. That's the 15-15 rule I was talking about. Want to keep that low to prevent inverse ghosting with the best overdrive modes. And then we have the final one um, here, which is a quick look at response times when the monitor is set to 60 hertz rather than the maximum refresh rate. In many cases, this causes worse response times and 60 hertz is quite a common use case for monitors if you say hooking it up to a console or you know some sort of other device that is outputting video. Not all output devices can do 144 hertz, so 60 hertz really is quite common and important. Input lag is also being tested by this new tool more accurately and with more samples. The estimated input lag here is a combination of both the processing lag and the refresh rate lag. Higher refresh displays can physically start showing you the results from an input sooner than low refresh monitors. So that's properly taken into account here. Then on top of that, we add on the average gray to gray response time. So you can see how long it takes from the display signal entering the monitor to hitting your eyeballs after the transition is complete. It's also worth mentioning that our new testing tool has been calibrated against a high-speed oscilloscope. So both the response time and input lag numbers from our new tool match what we'd be getting if we were just using the oscilloscope directly. And so it's always nice to have that level of accuracy. But we don't just have massive improvements to response time testing. I'll also be throwing in a number of other beautiful blue graphs for you. One of them is power consumption while calibrated and showing 200 nits. Maybe not as useful as the power consumption of a GPU or CPU, but still interesting to see which display is more more efficient. For brightness, we'll be showing full comparison charts. Not sure why I didn't do this before, but I will be now. For both brightness and contrast ratio charts, I'm also switching from default calibration to full calibration numbers, and that will give us a better apples to apples comparison than using the default factory numbers. And then on top of that, we have delta charts for both brightness and contrast. So you can see how a monitor is affected when you take factory settings and then calibrate it to be properly accurate. Usually we see a small decrease for brightness and contrast, and we're gonna show that here. Speaking of factory calibration, I have a chart here that will be showing how monitors stack up against each other in this realm. It will be particularly useful for professional displays and those that claim to be factory calibrated. And here's another cool chart I'll use from time to time showing how monitors compare in their wide gamut DCI-P3 coverage so you get a much better idea of how those wide gamut monitors fall amongst the pack of displays that advertise as being DCI-P3 capable. On top of all this stuff, I've also begun improving our HDR monitor testing so we have more data to show you. In the future, I want to roll out a more comprehensive HDR suite, but that requires, again, new testing tools, which we need to invest in with the help of our Patreons. As more HDR displays hit the market, it'll be more important to have these numbers, but for now, I still have a whole lot of new data points to show. Most of the new HDR tests involve showing how brightness and contrast compare between HDR-capable displays. 
I'll still be using this line chart to show how brightness falls off with window size, which is key for monitors with local dimming. But I also have several new HDR brightness charts. One here is for full screen sustained brightness, another for full screen flash brightness, and a third for 10% window sustained brightness, which really covers the three key areas of brightness for HDR without going into, you know, thousands of different brightness level charts, which would probably not be all that interesting. Then for contrast, again, new charts here, we have flash versus black contrast, and that shows the maximum contrast you'll get from a monitor between a full black image and a full screen peak white flash. So this could be, for example, in a movie that you're watching and there's a dark scene and then there's an explosion that you know ignites the screen based basically, and gives you that full bright white flash. This will be the contrast ratio that we'll see there. Then there's the full screen sustained contrast, and that's comparing full screen white versus full screen black, so a fairly standard contrast test. And then there's two single frame contrast tests. The first one measures the contrast between a full white 10% window and a black area on the edge of the display within a single frame. So while a monitor that has a dynamic backlight without local dimming could produce good results from the sustained white and flash white contrast tests, it will perform abysmally when measuring the contrast within a single frame. Having a high contrast ratio in this test is absolutely key to deliver high dynamic range. The whole point is to have bright highlights and dark shadows on the screen at the same time. So monitors that fail this metric fail to be HDR capable. And the monitors that do really well here are the ones that, for example, again, you're seeing a night scene and there might be some really bright neon lights as well as some really dark shadows. Those monitors that perform really well in this metric will show that sort of scene the best. And that's exactly what happens when you look at this data. The ASUS PG35VQ with its FALD backlight dominates the test, while the edge lit dimming LG32UL 950 and LG34WK950U, which both have Display HDR600 certification, only deliver mediocre results. Meanwhile, the two monitors on the bottom of the chart from ASUS and LG don't have any local dimming and are only Display HDR400. So they only deliver their native contrast in this test, which suffice to say looks pretty bad here. Then finally, we have a worst case single frame contrast test, which measures a white and black area close together in the same frame. This is basically like a Prime 95 stress test for HDR monitors. Nothing is going to perform well here, but the best locally dim displays will hit the top of the charts as we see here from the PG35VQ, which performs above its native contrast. Meanwhile, edge lit monitors will not perform well and will only deliver their native contrast. Finally, for all monitor reviews, I'll be showing some B-roll that looks like this, which will give you a good look at backlight bleed and so on. I get requests for that all the time. We'll be integrating that as well. There are a few other cool things our testing tools are built for, such as testing variable overdrive for G-Sync monitors, but we'll show you those results when it makes sense to do so. Needless to say, when you're watching a hardware and box monitor review in the future, you'll already be getting many more data points than ever before and the most comprehensive display reviews we've ever produced by a huge margin. So that's a look at our new test suite and some of the things we've been working on quietly in the background. Retesting all those monitors was pretty time consuming, but it'll be worth it for some of the reviews coming on the channel shortly. Big thanks to our Patreon members who support us and make this stuff possible. If you're not supporting us there, there's links in the description if you want to do so. And if you are a supporter, now you sort of know where your funds are going to. They go to improving our testing and other stuff like that. Consider subscribing, like this video if you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one.